It has been another week full of things that weigh the world down. For those of you who are tired, for those of you who see the images on the news and who read of the same violence against innocent black, indigenous people of color in this country, for those who come this morning tired of more police brutality and the lack of legislative action, I see you and I hear you. And today we gather to offer words of solace and find words of hope. I am sorry that for too many years we have failed to live up to our country's highest ideals. Those are incomplete because we have not built a place that will uphold equality and justice for all. And we are left to pick up the broken dreams of people who have come before us and find a way forward. We cannot go back, but by the grace of God, we will move forward together. Let us pray. Holy God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit as your word is proclaimed. May we hear what you have for us this day. Amen. On August 28, 1963, the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. were a place where hundreds of thousands gathered in the late summer sun for the March on Washington for jobs and justice. It was there that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous now, I Have a Dream speech. It was also where a young John Lewis called for a serious social revolution and where he made known the impatience of young civil rights organizers like himself. That day, Lewis said that, quote, we are tired. We are tired of being beat by policemen. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom and we want it now, unquote. Well, this past Friday, August 28, 2020, 57 years later, tens of thousands of people from all over the United States again joined to lift their voices on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial for the Commitment March. Its focus was to rekindle the spirit of 1963 and demand police reform and racial equality. And in 2020 words, quote, get your knees off our necks, unquote. The call for racial justice rang from the steps that afternoon. The Reverend Al Sharpton of the National Action Network, who hosted the event, says demonstration without legislation would not lead to change. And he called on legislators to pass bills on the reinstatement of voting rights and the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. The event featured family members of black Americans who have been killed by police or in other racially charged incidents, including George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Trayvon Martin, and others whose names have become rallying cries during recent national protests demanding justice. The cries of families of black Americans went up that day. They are cries for our nation and for elected officials to say their names, say their names, to remember these victims and to call for change. The father of Jacob Blake said this, there are two systems of justice in this country, a white system and a black system, and the black system isn't doing too well. It was a cry for our leaders, to the people and to the heavens, for us to do better. Jacob Blake is a 29-year-old. He was unarmed when he was shot in the back seven times by a police officer in Kenosha, Wisconsin, just a week ago. He's now in intensive care, paralyzed with gunshots that pierced his body at close range. And in response to the peaceful protests on the streets in Kenosha, a 17-year-old drove from his house in Illinois to Kenosha 
and with an AR-15-like assault rifle, opened fire on the streets, walked down the streets, killing two protesters, Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber, and injuring a third, Gage Grosskreutz. How long, O oh Lord, how long? The fight for racial equality is on our hearts and on our minds this day. And the demands of Congressman Lewis offered years ago couldn't feel more essential or familiar today. Freedom and freedom now. If there ever was a moment that we needed to hear a call from God, it is now. And in the words of the psalmist, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? So I wonder if you would come back with me centuries ago when the Hebrew people were amid their own suffering, enslaved at the decrees of a new king in Egypt. The Hebrew people are suffering and unable to get themselves out on their own from the hands of their oppressors. The Hebrew people cry out for help. They trust in God and hold on for dear life. It is a torrential storm of oppression and slavery that has them fearful of life itself. God hears their cries, and God is moved to respond. So God finds Moses. God meets Moses in the wilderness at Mount Horeb. God calls out to Moses in the wilderness in the midst of a burning bush. The wilderness in Scripture is more than just a place. It's also allegorical. The wilderness is a place of seeking and longing. It's a place of disorientation and God's reorientation. It's a place of discernment and self-discovery. God calls to Moses out of a burning bush. Now you can imagine that a burning bush may stand out in the wilderness. It probably glows this yellowish red hue. It probably crackles a little bit. And yet, it is only after Moses takes note of the bush and is curious about it that God calls out Moses. Moses. In the wilderness, God calls on Moses to sign up for a monumental job. God tells him that he is going to be sent back to Egypt to free the Hebrew people from their years-long enslavement. Well, at this point of the story, Moses is far removed from his life in Egypt. Long ago, he ran away from that life and escaped to another. He's he establishes a new life, marries the daughter of a priest of Midian, and now is spending his days tending sheep for his father-in-law. Compared to the life under the unjust policies of a cruel king, compared to a life of slavery and hard labor, Moses is living a pretty sweet life in Midian. And this is when God calls him to liberate the Hebrews from their life of brutal hard labor. I can't imagine that the first thing Moses would say is, Sure, God, sign me up for that task. Instead, upon hearing of the devastating nature of the slavery of the Hebrews, Moses might have said, Who, me? Wait a minute, me? Who am I to do that task, God? I don't have the words. I wouldn't know what to say. There is no way that I can do that. Remember, God, I am not well-liked back there in Egypt land. You should find someone else. So Moses names all of his fears and his hesitations and his limitations. He tries to rule himself out to God. But God sees a much fuller picture. God claims Moses worthy of the great task and offers this assurance. I will be with you. That's it. I will be with you. God knows how desperate the people are, 
They, he, God knows how loudly their cries have been calling up to God for help. God sees Moses differently than Moses sees himself. God knows his limitations and his fears and his anxiety, and yet God still sees all the reasons that Moses is the right one for this calling. God still sees why this is the perfect time for Moses to rise to the occasion. What intrigues me about this passage is that when Moses meets God in the wilderness, and God meets Moses in the wilderness, and in this place of disorientation and discernment. Moses walks toward God in curiosity. Moses does not walk away in fear. Moses walks toward God in curiosity, not away in fear. This curiosity begins the call of Moses to fulfill the promises of God, liberating the Hebrew people out of slavery. For Moses, this sacred encounter was not just personal and private. It was a time of consecration to serve God in the context of a community. For Moses, this moment on holy ground marks the beginning of something divinely initiated and orchestrated. An orchestrated venture into the liberation of God's people. Skip ahead to modern day. In the pandemic times in which we live, we certainly have had our fair share of wilderness moments in the last five months. As a church, as a city, as a country, and as a world, maybe you have been holding on for dear life during this tumultuous time. Maybe you believe you have been in the wilderness where nothing seems clear. I wonder if we, like Moses, can hear the call of God to us in the midst of the wilderness moments in our lives. Are we curious enough to keep watch? Are we curious enough to keep alert to the ways that God may be calling us? Perhaps Moses isn't really paying attention to what is going on around him until something looked out of the ordinary. But you have to wonder how many other burning bushes did Moses walk past before this one caught his attention? What would it be like for us to walk toward God in curiosity, not away in fear? If there ever was a moment when we needed to hear a call from God, a call forth to action for an end to the injustices against everyday black and brown bodies who are living in fear on our streets every day, it is now. If there ever was a moment to hear a call from God, it is now. On the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, on the streets of Kenosha or Portland or Columbus, the call to change the course and bring racial equality to fruition could not be more important. The cries of God's people could not be louder. People of God, wherever you are, stay curious for what God is calling you to. What action is God calling you to take? How, how can you learn and assist others in the cause for justice? We have to do our work. Our black and brown community members are tired. White folk, we need to be as outraged and as, and as vocal in our disgust so that we can come alongside and journey with anyone who's willing to stand up and speak out for the issues of racial equality. We also have to take action to rid ourselves of our own implicit bias, to retrain ourselves out of the ways in which white supremacy has infiltrated our culture in overt and subtle ways. Like Moses, we have to let our curiosity push against our fear. Maybe in the midst of such difficult times, such 
unimaginable violence in our streets and our personal and collective grief, the lesson is that God still hears us. That God understands what we are going through. That God knows our pain. And that God is already at work laying plans that will bring about our liberation. Maybe in this wilderness time for you, you have found yourself discerning, seeking a new purpose and meaning, wondering what exactly is going on right now and what is your place in it. And if this is you, keep an eye out for burning bushes. Keep an eye out for how God might be stirring in your heart and calling you to action. You may think your own limitations rule you out. You may think that it should be other people who are up to the task. You may have fully justifiable reasons for why it's not a good time to join God's liberating work. But like Moses, God may have different plans for you. Even still, God sees the bigger picture. God sees all those people that are in serious storms right now, and God may be calling on you to help. So the sixth lesson for such a time as this, living in pandemic times, give yourself permission to be curious. Walk toward curiosity and not away in fear. Amen.